Hello and welcome everyone. This is Andreas Amantonopoulos and this is session three of our massive open online course for the University of Nicosia's Masters in Digital Currency. A quick check to see that you can uh, see and hear me well. And if you can, just say something in the chat. Um, as always, quick logistics, we're going to be answering questions from the forums, from those of you who submitted questions during the week. Those obviously get priority. Um, if you are active in the chat, I am going to be looking for follow-up or clarification questions in the chat, which are follow-up or clarification questions to the thing I am discussing at that moment. If you try to throw other questions into the chat, I will probably miss them um, because it goes past too fast and I can't focus on two places at the time. Also, it's not fair to give priority to the people who are the squeakiest on the chat um, and who didn't do their homework during the week to submit questions in advance. Uh, so if you have a question that hasn't been asked or hasn't been answered that you need to ask about the topics of this week, instead of putting it as a question in the chat, put it in the Q&A panel of the Zoom and I will try to get to it at the end of the session. All right, let's uh, get started on this chapter. Tian asks, I'm writing to require about which sections, parts, areas of this session chapter we should focus more on and allocate more time to. Knowing everything, including in the learning material, is crucial to building up and enhancing our understanding. I'm still interested in confirming the specific areas we must concentrate on more. Now, keep in mind, session three and the topics of session three are probably one of the most technical um, chapters or sessions that we have in the MOOC. And that's because session three focuses on the internal uh, of Bitcoin, specifically on transactions, the UTXO model, and mining. And that involves a lot of novel concepts, uh, cryptography, public-private key cryptography, hash functions, transaction structure and mining. Now we will talk about more mining more in subsequent chapters. Um, but I think the, the real meat of today's session is um, public private key cryptography and hash functions, the cryptographic primitives and transactions, the structure and nature of transactions. And we have quite a few good questions on those uh, topics. All right, and we're starting with um, a multi-part question on transactions from Carmen. And uh, it opens up a number of different topics related to transactions. Uh, so let's see if we can answer those and give you a good head start and see if that opens up some more clarification questions. Carmen asks, one, what is included in a transaction? Addresses? or UTXOs? This is a really great question. And the answer is a transaction includes UTXOs. A transaction consumes UTXOs as inputs and produces UTXOs as outputs. The, the acronym UTXO is um, somewhat confusing um, because inputs and outputs are all UTXOs. Uh, the only difference between an input and an output is whether it's being consumed or produced by a transaction. So inputs are UTXOs that have previously been created and are now being consumed or spent by this transaction. So they're inputs. And outputs are UTXOs that are newly created by this transaction, which may be spent as inputs in a subsequent transaction, which may create outputs, which are then consumed as inputs. So outputs and inputs are simply a matter of time. First, you have outputs that are created. The earliest type of output is mined coins. So the reward of a Coinbase transaction, that's an output. And that's the first form of uh, an output, right? So if you ask the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg, what comes first, inputs or outputs? Obviously, outputs. 
And how can that be? That's because the Coinbase transaction doesn't have any inputs. It creates Bitcoin from the reward from nothing. It doesn't consume UTXO. It simply creates UTXO. And that's the only transaction that doesn't have inputs. All other transactions take existing outputs, uh, ones that are already recorded on the blockchain, um, and spend them. Until that moment, those outputs are recorded in the Bitcoin blockchain, the database, as unspent transaction outputs. So UTXO simply means outputs that haven't been spent yet. And so an input spends an unspent transaction output, and an output creates a new unspent transaction output. So transactions consume and create outputs. Addresses are not actually part of a transaction. They are um, emergent uh, artifacts of a transaction. And so when you look in a block explorer and you're looking at an address, um, that address is constructed in the Block Explorer to make it easy to visualize. And when you look at a balance of an address, again, that is something that is constructed by a Block Explorer. So what does it mean to look at the balance of an address? It's simply counting all of the outputs that uh, can be unlocked by that address. It isn't recorded. Um, on the blockchain. The balance of an address isn't recorded on a blockchain. What's recorded on the blockchain is outputs that belong to or can be unlocked by um, a specific address. And so in order to find out what the balance of an address is, you have to go through the blockchain and find all outputs that are uh, related to that address and then add up their value and that number, which doesn't exist on its own record in the blockchain, is the balance. So addresses are really a meta uh, feature, an artifact that is produced by wallets and block explorers. Uh, within the blockchain, what is recorded in a transaction are scripts. Um, and we'll talk about the relationship of scripts and addresses in just a second. So that was a great question to get us uh, started. The next question also relates to the follow-up that uh, Kayo asks uh, in the chat. So I'm going to get to that in a second. Carmen's second question is, to create a Bitcoin address, why do you need to hash twice? Is it because only one hash is not secure enough? Um, no, it is not because of security. Uh, in fact, uh, hashing once is perfectly adequate because the hash function cannot be brute forced in any meaningful way. And we don't know of any way to shortcut that process. So you can't reverse a hash. The reason that Satoshi Nakamoto used SHA-256 and then RIPEMD-160 is because RIPEMD-160 produces a 160-bit address, which is shorter. So when you uh, display that address in a traditional Bitcoin address, a legacy address that starts with one, that address is 160 bits long, which when encoded in base 58 is much shorter than a 256 bits long, right? So the reason that the second hash is RIPEMD160 is to produce an output that is shorter, um, and that produces an address that is easier to write down, it is easier to read, it is easier to encode in a QR code um, and scan. So uh, this was really uh, a practical consideration uh, to make the um, encoding of the address more compact. That's why it's ripe empty 160. Now, why is it double hashes? There's this pattern throughout Bitcoin and the development of Bitcoin where almost every uh, application of a hash is always a double hash. So almost everywhere in Bitcoin, 
when we say it's hashed by SHA-256, it's actually hashed twice. We don't know why uh, Satoshi made this choice. And as far as I know, there isn't any um, written documentation by Satoshi explaining this design choice. Why um, hashing the input by SHA-256 and then hashing the output of SHA-256 again as an input to SHA-256 to hash it twice. Um, we don't know why this double SHA function was chosen. Um, it doesn't really make a significant difference in the computation. When you hear, for example, that a block hash is the SHA-256 of the block header, it's a double SHA. When you hear um, about um, uh, other hashes and signatures, et cetera, they're always double SHAs. So it's always double hash, and we don't know why Satoshi made that design choice. Uh, it is a bit more secure. We don't know uh, really whether that security difference is significant enough, um, but it computationally, it's not very expensive, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so, so that's why the, the hashes are used in an address. Now, Kayo asks, how does the address, how is the address derived from the public key? You just hash it twice and use it as the address. Yes, that is one form of address. It's important to realize that an address is not always the hash of a public key. That is only one form of address. It's the most popular, the most commonly used form of an address. But there are many addresses that are not public keys. Uh, so the public key address or an address derived from a public key is the simplest form when in order to spend, all you have to do is produce a digital signature from the corresponding private key. So that's a single payer. It's the simplest uh, type of script, uh, also known as the script pub key. But uh, that's not the only type of address. In fact, all of the sophisticated use cases for Bitcoin um, encode more complex scripts. So those scripts could be things like multi-sig scripts, where you need signatures from multiple keys in order to spend the output. Those multi-sig scripts also have addresses, and the addresses are also hashes, but they're not hashes of public keys. They're hashes of the entire script. Um, other types of uh, scripts could be Lightning payment channel scripts or uh, hash time lock contract scripts from Lightning, um, or they could be any uh, weird or complex script that you can create. You can create very complex scripts. So, for example, you could have a Bitcoin script that has a structure like um, if this is spent um, within 30 days, of uh, the creation of this UTXO, then it requires three signatures from these three public keys. Um, but after 60 days, it only requires two signatures. After 90 days, it requires a single signature, but from this other key. Um, and after 180 days, it can be spent through um, this secret that's not a signature, right? So. Um, that's a rather complex script, um, but that script would also have an address, and the address would be the double hash of, of the script. We haven't talked about scripts yet, uh, JD. Uh, so for now, um, we can take the simplistic view that most addresses are public keys, uh, but that's not always the case. A couple of follow-up questions. Odair asks, is it hard for a government to find a balance of an address if they want to? No, not at all. Uh, if you run a node, um, a node can uh, simply count the UTXO from the UTXO database that corresponds to an address. And so it's not hard at all. So I run uh, my own node, and my node also has a database of all of the UTXO indexed by address. So I can simply type in an address and it will tell me what the balance is, which is very similar to running your own block explorer. That's essentially what it is. And mine has a web interface that is a block explorer that I run on a little computer at home. Um, when I say little computer, something like a Raspberry Pi or a mini PC uh, can do this. 
so you can either go to a public block explorer and ask it what is the balance of an address. Now, obviously, you're trusting them to run their nodes correctly and give you the right answer. Uh, but you can also get that answer from running your own node um, and then trusting that to authoritatively give you the answer based on evaluating all of the transactions and blocks uh, on the chain. Kayo asks another follow-up regarding balance. How can a wallet know the total amount of BTC it has if it's not clearly written in the block? The node that answers the wallet request just looks at the entire blockchain to understand the path of the uh, UTXO that's associated. Um, so kind of. So a, what a wallet does is it usually it's one of two things. Um, some wallets will have a complete database of all of the UTXOs that are on the blockchain, and therefore it can look up any um, it can look up any address in that database. Now that database is going to be several gigabytes in size, so your typical mobile wallet wouldn't have that. Um, a desktop wallet or server-based wallet would have that. On the other hand, however, most wallets are what are called lightweight wallets, which means they don't have a full copy of the blockchain and they don't have a full indexed database of all of the addresses. So if they want to find out what the balance of their wallet is, they ask um, effectively a block explorer or fully indexed node, hey, what's the address, uh, what's the balance of this address? So they rely on a third party service to look that up. Um, in Bitcoin, that's very often uh, what's known as an Electrum server. And an Electrum server is kind of the traditional most popular mechanism for creating a full index of all addresses and their balances. So that's how your wallet knows. It talks to a third party server that has all of the addresses. All right. Um, Uh, question number three from Cameron. Is the miner's fee always an output for every single transaction? Is it correct to say that if we don't include an output for the miner's fee, our transaction will never be performed because the miner will have no incentive to perform it? This is really two different questions, and I want to clarify them. So um, let's answer from the second one first. If you don't include a transaction fee, meaning if your fee is zero, if you don't include a transaction fee in your transaction, um, miners will not mine your transaction. The days of uh, mining zero fee transactions are over. You will not get your transaction mined. In fact, in most cases, the minimum fee you can put um, on a transaction is one Satoshi per V byte, which means about 200 to 250 Satoshis per transaction, that's the smallest transaction you can make, and at one Satoshi per byte, that ends up being about 250 Satoshis for the transaction. That's a, like the lowest fee you can put. And in many cases, nodes won't even propagate your transaction if it has less than that on it. So to answer the second part of your question, if you don't include a fee, uh, not only will your transaction not get mined, it probably won't even reach a miner because the nodes in between will not put it in their mempool and will not propagate it. Um, but the first part of your question is, is the miner's fee an output in a transaction? And the answer to that is no. The miner's fee is implied as the leftover of the outputs. Let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say you have a transaction. I'm just going to make up some numbers now, right? Let's say you have a transaction that in its inputs, it spends 10 Bitcoin. Yeah. And then in its outputs, it pays 8 Bitcoin. Now, what that means is that it's consumed 10, but it's only allocated or spent 8 of that 10 um, to outputs. Well, there's 2 Bitcoin missing there. What happens to that 2 Bitcoin? That's the fee. So the fee is the sum of the inputs minus the sum of the outputs, meaning you consume the amount that is recorded in the inputs, you consume the value of the inputs in a transaction, 
and you spit out outputs that are less than or equal to that amount you consumed. And if they are less than the amount that you consumed, the difference, the leftover, the amount of value that you didn't convert into outputs uh, is basically left on the table for the miner to put in as a fee. The miner can then look at when they're constructing a block, they're going to count up the value of all of the inputs. They're going to add up the value of all of the outputs of all of the transactions. And in the end, they're going to take the difference and any value that's left over that hasn't been created in outputs, they take as a fee and they put it in their coin base. And that way they balance the block. If you think about it now, all of the inputs add up to a certain value. All of the outputs plus the coin base add up to the same value. And so the leftover went into the coin base um, as a reward to the miner, and that's how they collect the fees. Now, in the example transaction I gave you, there wasn't a change output, but a change output is just like any other output. Uh, whether you have a change output or not is simply a matter of how your wallet constructed that transaction and whether it needed change. Change isn't a special output. You can't tell by looking at outputs on the blockchain which one is payment and which one is change. And in fact, that's deliberate. Uh, they're not in a specific order. Uh, and um, many wallets, for privacy reasons, do not put the change output as the last output in the transaction, so as not to make it obvious which one is change. And because they uh, send the change output to an address in your own wallet that has never been used before, there's no way by looking at the addresses in the outputs or the amounts in the outputs to figure out which is change and which is payment. So it, it doesn't matter whether there is change or there isn't change uh, is the same. Whether your wallet constructs a transaction that requires it to pay some change back into your own wallet or whether the by coincidence the amount that you need to pay is exactly right and all that's left is the fee. Um, and there is no change, it's the same thing. The fee is always the leftover amount, the amount of inputs that was consumed but not uh, spent as outputs. All right, I'm seeing a couple of questions that are not directly related to the thing that I'm talking about right now. Those are not follow-up questions. I will not answer them. So if you want to ask questions like that, put them in the Q&A panel, not in the chat. Um, all right, number four. Carmen asked, what is the number of signatures for the following transaction types? A consolidation transaction with three inputs and one output. Does that have three signatures? Yes, it has three signatures. A payroll transaction from one input to three outputs. Does that have one signature? Yes, it has one signature. And the easy way to understand this is this. Um, inputs are signed. That's it. Inputs are signed. In order to consume or spend uh, something as an input, you have to uh, identify which output you're spending and then fulfill the requirements of the, that output by producing a signature that shows that you are authorized to spend that. So inputs contain signatures. In traditional Bitcoin, the signatures are right there in the input. In segregated witness Bitcoin, which we'll talk about in a subsequent chapter, the signatures are in a separate part of the transaction structure, but each input has a corresponding signature in the witness part. Um, regardless, every input uh, has a signature. There are some exceptions to that. So that's the simplistic rule. In most common transactions, every input has uh, a signature. There are some uh, differences uh, in that scenario because uh, signature types exist, and we'll, we'll, we won't get into that much uh, detail. All right. Next question comes from Christian. 
The most common form of a transaction is a simple payment from one Bitcoin address to another, which often includes some change to be returned to the original owner. This type of transaction has one input and two outputs. So Christian is quoting from the material in the course. Why is there change and is it necessary? And this is, uh, this is a quirk in Bitcoin that is a bit difficult to understand. The reason we have change is because Bitcoin uses a UTXO model of accounting. So it's a UTXO based um, system. Bitcoin and other UTXO based systems like Litecoin or Liquid, etc., um, all have the need for change. But nowadays, the vast majority of blockchains are not UTXO based. They are, in fact, account based, like Ethereum. And Ethereum does not have change. In an account based system, you don't have change. And the difference is in how amounts are tracked. So in an account-based system like Ethereum, every address has a balance that is recorded on the blockchain, and you simply record the changes from um, one state to another. So a transaction says, okay, and whatever the balance was, we're now adding two ETH to it. And so it was whatever it was before plus two ETH. And if you want to count or figure out the balance of an address, you have to go back and look at all of the transactions that have happened with that address and do plus or minus changes for the balances, you know, credits and withdrawals to calculate the current balance. This is the same way banks work. So your bank statement or your credit card statement is an account based system. UTXO is more like physical cash where you have coins and notes. And you can think of the, the coins or notes as being UTXO. They are the chunks of value and they are indivisible. If I have a $1 bill, I cannot tear it in half and give half of it to someone and say, this is 50 cents. It's not 50 cents. If you, in fact, if you tear it in half, it's zero cents because you just destroyed <laughs> you just destroyed that um, uh, currency. But the point is that you can't divide a dollar bill uh, and spend only half of it. You 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 have or if you have a twenty dollar or twenty euro note, you can't spend half of a twenty euro note. You have to spend the whole twenty euro note, and then that creates the need for change, because if what you're buying is worth less than 20 euros, then you're going to have some change back. And that change is going to come in the form of other coins or notes, so that the difference adds up, right? So, yeah, Don says, for dollars, whichever side has more than 50% is redeemable for a full dollar. Yes, you can reconstruct the currency from a piece, um, and the biggest piece it is the full currency and the other pieces are zero. Yes, okay, but you understand what I'm uh, saying in general. You, you can't uh, divide the dollar. Now, this, is, this wasn't always true. In fact, the first forms of metal coins were cut into pieces. So because the first forms of coins were gold, people would cut them and cut them like a pizza, basically, into little slices uh, they would give out. And, and many different currencies have some equivalent of the word for slice or piece um, as, uh, as a word that refers to coins. I believe the British pence uh, comes from the concept of a piece because they would cut them. Um, but in modern currency, you can't do that, even in cash. You can't cut a coin. In fact, if you notice, there's little ridges around the edge, and those little ridges are so that if someone tries to file off or cut the edge, um, it, it is visible. So it's a tamper-evident mechanism to make it sh uh, show that you've tried to tamper with a coin, and this obviously is a leftover design 
from when coins were made of gold. And if you took a tiny, tiny piece off the edge, um, you could cheat uh, the person who's receiving that coin. But anyway, UTXO, think of it as coins. Now, the big difference, of course, is that while UTXO is not divisible, so you can't cut it in half and spend only half of it, whatever chunk of UTXO you have, you have to spend the entire UTXO. The value of the UTXO isn't a round number, meaning that whereas you have a $20 bill and a $5 bill and you don't have a $19.873 bill, um, with UTXO, you do have a 19.873 UTXO that in fact is indivisible and you can only spend the entire 19.873. And this is, the f this is basically how UTXO is created. So if you look at the outputs of a transaction, you're constructing new UTXO at specific value amounts. Those value amounts, once you've recorded them on the blockchain, are indivisible. So if you create a UTXO in your transaction as an output that is 19.873, um, then that's its value and that's um, indivisible. So next, if you want to spend 18 and you have a 19.873, well, you have to spend the entire 19.873 uh, give 18 to your recipient, and then what's going to happen to the rest? Um, you could make all of it a fee. So if you just take the 19.873 and you spend and you give 18 to your recipient, then the 1.873 that's left over becomes the fee. But if that's too much of a fee and you want to make it less of a fee, maybe you put some change. So maybe you put... 1.573 as change, and that will leave 0 0.3 as fee left over, right? So now you've created two UTXO, an 18 UTXO, which is your payment, and a 1.573 UTXO, which is your change. Where does the UTXO for the change go? Well, it can go anywhere. And, and this is where how the wallet behaves makes a difference in your privacy. And this is important to understand. Your wallet constructs these transactions and it can decide which address to use for change and which address to use for receiving and which address to use and which inputs to consume and how many outputs to produce and how much change to produce and how much fee to put in to the transaction. Your wallet has complete freedom. The blockchain doesn't care. Uh, and in fact, if your wallet does something stupid, like putting the entire amount as fee, the miners will take the money and you've just um, uh, spent all of your money on fees. And this has happened many times. People have paid millions of dollars in fees by accident um, by constructing a transaction that's basically stupid. Their wallet's making a bad mistake. Is it possible, as Waldo asked, for change and fee doesn't match the original UTXO? Well, if it's more than the original UTXO, um, then the transaction is invalid because you're trying to spend more than you have, right? So if, if the sum of the outputs is more than the inputs, um, then that's impossible because that's an invalid transaction. It will be rejected by everyone who sees it. Um, but because the fee is always implied, it's never an actual output, um, if the output, the payment, the change, all of the outputs are less than the inputs, whatever's left over is the fee. And if you leave over too much, then you pay a very big fee. And that's how people get into these mistakes where they pay millions of dollars in fee. Basically, they forgot an output. They forgot to take change. Um, so that's basically um, how that works. Let's see, what else do we need to say about change? Right, so as I was saying, your wallet constructs this. Now, for privacy reasons and for security reasons, there is a principle or um, concept in Bitcoin, which is address reuse. So Bitcoin wallets 
uh, almost all Bitcoin wallets are designed to avoid reusing addresses. And the reason for that is because if you reuse an address, you're creating a little trail of information. You're revealing information on the blockchain because if someone say, sees the same address twice, they can say, okay, uh, this address is owned by the same person. And since it appeared in this transaction and then it appeared again in this transaction and then it appeared again in this transaction, we can assume that all three of these transactions were the same person so or entity or user. And so effectively what that does is it breaks your privacy. For that reason, as well as for security, which we'll get to when we talk about quantum computing, um, address reuse is uh, discouraged and wallets do not reuse addresses. Uh, we'll talk about uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets and wallet structures in a subsequent session, but I'll give you a preview. Um, your wallet can generate um, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of addresses from a single seed. And so what your wallet does at any moment in time is every time it needs an address, uh, for example, to put change in or to receive money or whatever, it simply creates a new one. Um, from the database, right? From the seed, it just derives a new address. And because these addresses are not in any way uh, correlated, only your wallet knows that they come from the same seed. There's no way for anybody else to see that they come from the same seed. Your wallet can manage them all. Um, but to the outside perspective, someone looking on the blockchain will see, uh, let's say, um, 18 Bitcoin going to one uh, address for the output and 1.573 Bitcoin going to another address. Those could be in any order in your outputs, right? And um, we'll not know which is change because it won't be the same address as the input. Your wallet will use a brand new address for that change. Um, someone looking at the blockchain can't tell which one is change, which one is payment. And there's no reason why you would put one change um, output. You could create two change outputs. So you could have an 18 payments to your recipients, and then you could have a one payment to one of your addresses uh, as change, and then you could have a 0 0.573 um, output to another change address from your wallet. Um, and again, it would be no, there would be no way of knowing which of these is the uh, change and which of these is the payment. Um, you could make some assumptions based on the amounts, uh, but then again, you might be very wrong about those assumptions. So 99.99% of all of the wallets you uh, use, especially the ones that are modern, that use uh, 12 to 24 word seeds based on the common standards, um, they all do this kind of address management. Every time you say, um, I want to receive uh, Bitcoin, uh, give me an address, it will give you an address. And if you use that address, it will then give you a different address the next time you ask. Uh, every time your wallet constructs a transaction, it will put the change in a different address that it only uses once and it only uses for change. And so your wallet is automatically. Kyle asks, if the wallet mixes change from different addresses, can that be a danger to my privacy? Labeling the change addresses is a good practice. Well, your wallet actually um, gets change addresses from a different part of the tree than it gets receive addresses. So your wallet is already labeling change addresses. Um, and this is basically in the structure of a seed, uh, by convention, wallets will generate one set of addresses for receiving and a completely different sequence of addresses for change. And th so they'll know that it's a change address because um, it will be derived from the branch of change addresses. But separately from that, if to answer your original question, if your wallet combines change uh, in a transaction, so for example, it consumes two inputs um, from different ad addresses, um, either from money you've received or from change or both, 
then yes, that diminishes your privacy. And wallets have certain strategies to protect your privacy in how they select which inputs to consume so as to reduce the exposure of your privacy by mixing together different addresses. Obviously, if you, on the one hand, are not reusing addresses, but then you have to combine them uh, in order to spend in a tr transaction, then you basically blew that strategy. So it's a complex strategy and uh, it's, it's hard to do. Some wallets do this well, others do not do it well. I'll give you one example. Uh, a wallet that's known for doing this very well is uh, a smartphone wallet for Bitcoin called Samurai. Uh, that's an example of a privacy focused wallet. Uh, and it does a lot more than just these techniques. But almost all wallets do some address and UTXO management to protect your privacy. Uh, Carmen asks, uh, if we go to the payroll example, does this mean that every time I'm going to get paid, I have to tell my employer a new address to keep my privacy? Yes, uh, it does. Uh, you either have to tell your employer a new address or you have to give them what's known as an extensible public key. We'll talk about that in a subsequent chapter, which is basically a master um, address from which they can generate a new address for your wallet without being able to see anything um, other than those new addresses. Aristoteles asks, UTXO is not divisible, but can you combine the UTXOs to one UTXO with the sum of all? Yes, and the way you do that is with the special type of transaction, which we call an aggregating transaction. Now, this is not a technical term, it's just a, a term, a concept I came up with when I was writing my book. Um, but it's basically trying to describe, if you see a transaction on the blockchain that has 15 inputs and one output, almost certainly what that is, is someone trying to consolidate a whole bunch of little UTXOs that they have into a bigger UTXO. And usually the reason for this is because of fees. Um, so if you have lots of little UTXOs, then many of the transactions you're going to create are going to have lots of inputs, and that means they're going to have uh, bigger fees. Uh, if you're investing over time in small amounts, you want to find a time when the fees are low on the blockchain to consolidate all of these little UTXOs uh, so you don't end up with very high fees when you try to spend. Looking at transactions on mempool space, why are there so many transactions that use the same address for the change and list it as the last UTXO? Um, how do you know that they're using the same address for the change and listing it as the last UTXO? It, mi it, might, be, um, it might be transactions from exchanges. Uh, ex exchanges often use uh, a single address to pool customer funds. Um, because th their privacy does not depend on hiding the fact that this is an exchange transaction. Um, and it's it's not always the, knowing which is the last UTXO doesn't tell you that that's necessarily a uh, change. Oswaldo says, I'm convinced that my ledger uses the same address for all ERC-20 blockchains in my accounts, which is discouraged. Does that make sense? Ah, very good question, Oswaldo. Uh, everything I said about address reuse works very well with UTXO-based, account-based blockchains like Ethereum, which is what you're referring to when you talk about ERC-20. Um, you don't do that. Uh, so, in fact, address reuse is the norm in Ethereum. In fact, everybody uses just one address. Uh, even though your wallets can generate multiple addresses, uh, the problem is in Ethereum, you can only have one input and you can only spend from one address. And therefore, uh, in an Ethereum transaction, you're always using, you're always paying from a single address. You can't combine uh, balances from multiple addresses, which makes it very difficult to manage where your balance is 
um, on Ethereum. And especially because addresses in Ethereum are also used as identifiers for authorization, for ownership, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Ethereum is really um, very weak on privacy at the base layer because address reuse is common. In fact, it's, it's almost 100% address reuse on all wallets. Um, it's very difficult to not reuse addresses and those identifiers can be tracked very easily. Uh, um, Abdul Baki asks a question that's about a DEX. Uh, questions that are not on the topic I'm discussing need to go into the Q&A, not the chat. I'm not going to be answering off-topic uh, questions in the chat. Uh, Kayo asks, so using a bunch of smaller UTXOs in a transaction could be considered a bad practice in terms of efficiency and privacy, considering it takes UTXOs from many different addresses. Yes. But if that's what you have, you don't have a choice. You're going to relate those all together. You're either going to do it in a payment you're making at the time you need to make a payment to someone, and then you're going to pay whatever fee the network has at that moment um, to use all of these different uh, small UTXOs as your inputs to make a payment that you wanted to make, because you're not choosing the timing, right? You need to buy this t-shirt right now or whatever, um, you're paying whatever fee is necessary to get your transaction confirmed on the network right now, which is why if you're smart and you know you're going to have to combine these UTXOs to make payments in the future because they're too small, you choose the time. You choose the time when the fee is low. You do a consolidating transaction to a single UTXO, and now you have a single big UTXO. You've already lost the privacy because you're going to combine these small UTXOs anyway together. The question is whether you do it um, at your chosen time or whether you do it at the time when you have to make a payment and therefore you pay whatever fee you have to pay. Now, um, it's important to understand that uh, privacy based on not reusing addresses is, is not good privacy. It's better than reusing all of the addresses, in which case it's trivial to do statistical correlation, but it's not actually a private blockchain. And this is one of the major weaknesses of uh, any blockchain that doesn't have strong cryptographically ensured anonymity at the base layer. So Ethereum, Bitcoin, and 99% of all of the blockchains, the ones that are known not as anonymous or private um, coins, um, they do not have privacy. You can do statistical correlation. Now, you can obviously do statistical correlation a lot easier if everybody's reusing uh, their one and only address all the time. Then the statistical correlation is trivial, as it is in the case of, for example, Ethereum. Um, but uh, you can still do it with Bitcoin. It's a bit more difficult. And, you know, all of this is probabilities. You can say, I am 87 uh, percent sure that this belongs to the same person based on this pattern. Um, and 87 percent is uh, significantly more certain than zero percent, as you would have in an anonymous coin. Um, but it's still better than being 100 percent sure. Right. So. Uh, Privacy is not an absolute. It's a, it's a statistical game. Um, and so UTXO doesn't give you privacy. Uh, it's just that if you do UTXO and you reuse addresses, then you really, really make it easy for someone to do the statistical correlation. Um, Jean Curtis says, do any hardware wallets support non-reuse addresses natively? Um, it seems Exodus wallets with Trezor integration can. Uh, again, the, the, the wallet software will have a strategy as to whether it reuses. The hardware wallet is not involved in that strategy. Um, transactions are not constructed on the hardware wallet. Transactions are constructed on the software component you use. And that can be the manufacturer's software wallet. It can be uh, a third-party software wallet that has integration with your hardware wallet or whatever. But the transactions and which addresses to use and how to construct them and whether to use outputs, and, uh, blah, 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 blah. All of that is done by the software component. 
the hardware wallet uh, generates keys and signs transactions, but it doesn't construct the transactions. So hardware wallets can support whatever transaction the software wallet constructs with whatever combination of outputs and address reuse and privacy techniques um, that you use on the software side. It's not really, um, it's not really. Uh, Odera asks, Monero is a good one for privacy then. Monero is one of the uh, systems that has cryptographically uh, protected anonymity in the base layer of the blockchain. You cannot correlate addresses. Um, and as John Curtis points out, governments are looking to ban and restrict all uh, privacy coins. Uh, ironically, they have been uh, fundamentally unsuccessful at doing that. Uh, all they've done is made it harder to uh, use those on exchanges. Uh, but of course, transactions between private individuals are very difficult to regulate in that case. All right, uh, let's see. Monica asks, Bitcoin is based on the UTXO model rather than the account-based model. What would be the implication if a central bank digital currency would also be based on a UTXO model? What would be the advantage, disadvantage, and how difficult would it be to connect to it? Curious to understand your opinion. I can almost guarantee that no central bank digital currency or CBDC will implement a UTXO model. Uh, and the reason is that the UTXO model is a type of model that is designed for a decentralized uh, currency um, and for a currency that is striving to provide some degree of anonymity. Neither of those things are desirable characteristics in central bank digital currencies. Um, and, you know, there is no bank that uses this. Um, banks are already hostile to cash, which is the closest thing to a UTXO model. And so a central bank digital currency will not be based on UTXO. Uh, there are too many disadvantages. It makes the use of wallets cumbersome. It makes the fee structure complicated. Uh, you pay all of these uh, costs in terms of difficulty and complexity to gain what? Uh, to gain some pseudo anonymity um, and some decentralization, neither of which are desirable, as I said, in a central bank digital currency. So I will guarantee you um, th this is a, about as much prophecy as you're going to get from me, uh, but I will guarantee you that a central bank digital currency will use an account-based model, just like all banks uh, and even most blockchains use today. Bright asks, how can one tell the difference between a public key and an address? Um, well, um, they're encoded uh, in a way that they appear different, is the best answer I can give you. So addresses um, are represented, encoded, uh, in particular formats that can be identified. So for example, let's say in Bitcoin, if you see something that begins with a one, um, and it's a uh, base 58, so upper lowercase uh, alphabetic and numeric uh, characters, then that is an address. And specifically, it's an address that corresponds to a public key. So it's the double hash of a public key. A public key, by comparison, you will never see one. Um, you will never see one because your wallet doesn't show you public keys ever. It has no reason to show you public keys. The only time when you will see something related to a public key is um, what's known as an extensible public key. And that's uh, basically a master public key that can generate many public keys. That's used in things like e-commerce shops uh, so that you can have a website that can generate public keys and addresses to receive payments without having any of the private keys for security. Um, and that's identifiable because the encoding format starts with the characters XPUB, X-P-U-B. So if you see that, that's an extensible public key. That's the closest thing you'll see. Inside the software, 
where public keys are handled. And inside the transactions where public keys are recorded, they are recorded as numbers. And those numbers, um, I mean, obviously addresses, private keys, public keys, hashes, they're all numbers, right? Seeds, they're all numbers. Everything is numbers. Um, but some of these numbers are also encoded or represented um, with alphanumeric character sets, with prefixes that you can identify their purpose or their use. Um, so they're more identifiable. Whereas things like public keys, we don't have, um, we don't commonly use, it does exist, but we don't commonly use an encoding to show it to the user because the user never needs to see it. In the blockchain, they're just recorded as binary numbers. So how can one tell the difference between a public key and an address? Um, by context. Uh, and you probably never see a public key. You only ever see an address. All right, I see uh, several more comments which are in the chat, which are not on topic. So I'm gonna leave those for later. If you want them answered, ask them in the Q&A. Igor has a question about ordinals and inscriptions. It's a bit out of topic for this session, but I'll go over it quickly. Is the deployment of ordinals and inscriptions important for Bitcoin development? I would say no. Uh, could you please briefly explain how it works? Uh, yes, basically it's taking images or other metadata and um, putting it in the space that is normally reserved for digital signatures so that they can uh, ride on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, where in the blockchain is this information written? In the space for signatures, also known as the witness tree. And um, what is your opinion about these recent developments? Um, I think they are pointless. Uh, I think that what they're trying to do is uh, make Bitcoin do NFTs and colored coins and digital assets uh, the way Ethereum does. And Bitcoin is not good at doing those things. And the way they're doing it with ordinals is relatively wasteful of the blockchain space without achieving any really significant advantages over doing these things on Ethereum instead. Uh, so I, I think it's a fad. I honestly think that after a while, you're going to see less and less and less use of that. People have been trying to do this for uh, since the very beginning, almost since 2012, when the first colored coin implementations came out. Um, and they didn't get much traction because they were complicated and cumbersome to do on Bitcoin uh, until Ethereum came along and made it easy to do them. And the market has already decided Ethereum is the way to do this. And you, it won't, in my opinion, and this is an opinion, uh, it won't succeed on Bitcoin because it, it doesn't fit the design uh, characteristics of Bitcoin. Okay, um, I'll answer Vince's question because it's somewhat relevant to the discussion about inputs and outputs. What input did Satoshi Nakamoto when he used when he mined the first Bitcoin block? What UTXO did he get? Um, so um, I did mention this briefly and I'll say it again just to be understood. There is one transaction that doesn't have inputs and that is the Coinbase transaction. Every block has one transaction, the Coinbase transaction, which only has an output, and that output is the reward, block subsidy or fees, um, that go to the miner. Uh, so uh, when Satoshi mined the Genesis block, the Genesis block had a Coinbase transaction. It has to have a Coinbase transaction. Uh, the Coinbase transaction has no inputs, and it only has outputs, and those outputs, um, that output, a single output, was um, the 50 Bitcoin reward paid to a specific Bitcoin address. And obviously that UTXO has never been spent. It's an output that is sitting there. Uh, theoretically, um, Satoshi Nakamoto could come back with a private key to that uh, um, address 
and spend that UTXO from the for, from the Genesis block. Um, but no, that didn't have an input. Coinbase transactions do not have inputs. Uh, that's how Bitcoin is created in the first place. It's created by the Coinbase transaction that has only outputs um, in the process of mining. Um, Luis, your question about mining is off topic for now. If we could put it in the q and I'll get to it in a bit. Um, all right, let's move on. So the next, the next set of uh, questions is about quantum computing. Uh, okay, pause there. Uh, Kyle asks, so every Coinbase transaction is the root of a tree of transactions. Bingo. Yes. Every Coinbase transaction is the root of a tree of transactions, meaning that if you take a transaction and you look at its inputs, its inputs are outputs from a previous transaction, and then you look at that transaction and its inputs are outputs from a previous transaction, and you look at that transaction, if you keep going back, and you can do this on a block explorer, you can just keep clicking on the inputs and keep going back. Eventually, you're going to arrive at a Coinbase transaction, meaning that the input, when you click on it, is the output of a Coinbase transaction. It's basically a miner spending um, their Coinbase uh, reward. So if you, uh, transactions are basically trees, uh, because the inputs of one are the outputs of a previous transaction, so they form a tree structure, or if you like a linked list, um, uh, but it, but it's a branched link list, so it looks like a tree. And if you follow um, the transaction backwards, you will end up at a Coinbase transaction. So all Bitcoin originates in a Coinbase transaction. That was a great, great point from Kyle uh, and worth stopping for a second there. Okay, now let's go to quantum computing and private keys. Jason asks, could quantum computers have the potential to break the one-way function and calculate the private key from the public key? Also, is the Bitcoin mining system under threat from the prospect of quantum computing technology? All right, so this is a two-part topic, and it's a topic that is discussed very, very frequently in Bitcoin and in other systems. So let, let's explain this. In, in Bitcoin, there are effectively two major categories of cryptographic functions that are used. The first one is digital signatures and public-private key cryptography. So this is the private key, public key, address, and signature, which forms the basis for proving that you own um, the output of a transaction and therefore you are allowed to spend it. There are currently two implementations of the private public key cryptography system and signature system on Bitcoin. Um, the private public key is based on an elliptic curve. So it uses elliptic curve cryptography. So the way you produce a public key from a private key is by multiplication on the elliptic curve. And that's the one way function in Bitcoin. The elliptic curve itself is a specific elliptic curve. Um, it's known as SECP256K1. Uh, it is a standard curve um, that's used in many cryptographic functions, but most prominently in Bitcoin. Other systems use different curves, but the fundamental concept is the same. On this elliptic curve, there are two possible ways to produce a digital signature. The way Bitcoin was built in the beginning use the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm or ECDSA, and that's traditional Bitcoin signatures. As of uh, 2020 um, or 2021, the, uh, a new signature format was introduced called Schnorr signatures. Schnorr signatures are a different way of producing signatures, again, on the elliptic curve. The elliptic curve one-way function itself is a generalized 
uh, or is a specific implementation of the more general uh, mathematical problem known as the discrete logarithm problem, uh, which is basically trying to find prime factors of a large number. Um, and in mathematics, that is a one-way function because with classic computers, the only way to find prime factors um, is either brute force, try all possible combinations, or a slightly faster but not fast enough um, thing called a sieve function. Um, both of those, if applied on a classic computer, uh, a classical computer, a non-quantum computer, would take um, millions and millions and millions or trillions and quadrillions of years, even if you use millions of computers consuming gigajoules of energy. And essentially, the system is secure because there is not enough energy, there is not enough computing power, and there is not enough time in our present universe to break this with a classical computer. What a quantum computer, however, does is it uses an algorithm which tries um, all of the solutions at once. And if a quantum computer has enough uh, qubits, it can do so instantaneously. So out goes all of that security. The first part of that sentence is really important, which is the part that says, if a quantum computer has enough qubits. In current quantum computers, qubits are used for two reasons. One is to do the calculation, and the other one is to check the quality and coherence or the error rate of that calculation. Um, because of uh, certain phenomena of quantum decoherence, which occur because of noise in the system uh, that have not been solved, um, you need a lot more qubits than you would simply to execute the algorithm if you want to get a result. And those qubits are engaged in all of this error correction um, because of uh, decoherence of the quantum effects, because of errors that occur in the quantum computer. It is estimated that based on the current technology, you would require a quantum computer that has millions of qubits in order to break ECDSA or elliptic curve cryptography of the order of 256 bits, which is what we use in Bitcoin. So millions of qubits, given the current error rate and error correction methods that are being used. Um, and the world's most sophisticated quantum computer is in the order of hundreds of qubits. So hundreds, millions, that's a very big gap. The other interesting thing is how fast are we moving in terms of increasing the number of qubits? And so far, what appears to be happening is we're not moving very fast, meaning that the increase in the number of qubits uh, and the processing of a quantum computer is not as fast as Moore's law. We're not getting a doubling every 18 months or anything like that. In fact, um, many people see a, a kind of plateau in the number of qubits. So even if you had Moore's law applying on the number of qubits, it, it, we're talking about 25 years before you can get to the number of qubits that would break elliptic curve um, at its current rate. That's assuming that in that time, we don't implement a different signature algorithm. Because if you implement a quantum safe signature algorithm, or you change the type of uh, elliptic curve or cryptography, private public key or asymmetric cryptography uh, system you use, um, then a quantum computer would be no better at breaking that. Um, so a quantum computer cannot break Bitcoin as it is today. A quantum computer in the future might be able to break Bitcoin as it is today, if we didn't change Bitcoin in the meantime, and we have, in many people's estimation, many years, decades, um, before we have to consider these changes. And in fact, the implementation of Schnorr signatures demonstrated that it is possible and quite 
straightforward to upgrade the signature algorithm and have both signature algorithms running in parallel on the system. One of the challenges that arises, however, is that if you upgrade the um, signature system or the cryptography system in, in Bitcoin, um, the money is only protected if the current owners move their Bitcoin to addresses um, and keys that are safe under quantum cryptography. And that brings a big question, which is what happens with the 1 million plus Bitcoin that was mined presumably by Satoshi and early miners that has never been moved and never been spent. If those keys are gone um, and no one can move them to safe uh, keys, uh, then there might come a time in the future where a quantum computer can break uh, the legacy cryptography and because those amounts have never been moved, they will move suddenly, all of them. Um, and so one of the things that, that happens is a quantum computer can go and harvest abandoned or lost Bitcoin um, that has not been moved to a quantum safe algorithm. So these are all of the parameters, strategic and tactical parameters that apply to, um, that apply to uh, quantum computing. The second part of your question is much more uh, interesting and nuanced, which is the Bitcoin mining system is that under threat from the prospect of quantum computing. And this is where a lot of people get this very, very wrong. Um, you'll hear all over media where they talk about, okay, quantum computers would break Bitcoin mining. And in fact, that is not the case. Bitcoin mining depends on SHA-256 or hash functions. Hash functions are not... Um, mathematical equations similar to elliptic curve uh, cryptography that can easily be solved by a quantum computer. In fact, I don't know of a demonstrated quantum algorithm that's any faster than a brute force for hash functions because hash functions do not use a mathematical equation for which a quantum algorithm exists. Um, they use uh, basically a mixing system where they uh, shift um, add and uh, use exclusive or binary functions to jumble up the bits of their input in blocks to produce the final hash. There is no demonstrated quantum algorithm for that, which means that quantum computers would actually not affect hashing. They'd affect digital signatures. They'd allow people to um, reverse engineer the private key from a public key uh, and um, potentially spend the Bitcoin. And this is where you get a glimpse of perhaps the genius of Satoshi Nakamoto and how prescient he was, how he was able to predict certain things might happen and had the insight to see some future development. Because Digital signatures and public keys are only recorded on the blockchain when you spend a UTXO. Whereas what's actually recorded on the blockchain in a UTXO before it's spent, when it's unspent, is a hash. It's an address. It's the hash of a script or the hash of the public key. And it, it, you see, I, I just talked about how we don't have any good quantum algorithms to break hashes. Hashes are not, at least so far, breakable by quantum computers, which means that in order for a quantum computer to spend um, money that has been locked, uh, they have to see a public key or a signature. And they can only see a public key or a signature if an address is reused. If you don't reuse addresses, then the moment a public key or signature appears on the blockchain, the amount of money that was in that address is already gone and the balance is zero. It's now in a new address, which only appears as a hash. That address gets spent. You see the public key and the signature, but then it already has a zero balance, which means that even if a quantum computer did emerge, there's a very good chance it wouldn't be able to spend Satoshi's unspent coins because there are no 
public keys or signatures visible for those. All we see in the blockchain are the hashes, the addresses, um, and quantum computers can't break hashes. So quantum computers cannot break mining. They cannot disrupt mining based on what we know now. Uh, there is no quantum algorithm for hashes, for reversing hashes or brute forcing hashes fast. And because of this perhaps genius idea by Satoshi to not record the public key, but instead to only record the double hash of a public key in the blockchain and only record the public key when you spend it, uh, at which point if you're not reusing the address, there's no money in it, we may have, in fact, a fantastic defense against quantum computing, even for the unspent money. All right. Um, Emanuela asks, how might the development of quantum computers impact the security of traditional cryptographic algorithms used to protect private keys in blockchain and cryptography systems? We've already talked about this. I just wanted to repeat that's the more general question. And the answer is that quantum computers can break all classical cryptography algorithms that are based around things like the discrete logarithm problem, which is almost all private, public, asymmetric cryptography and digital signature systems. In fact, we do not yet have a quantum resistant algorithm that has survived extended scrutiny for asymmetric cryptography. So that's a problem. But it's a problem that's much bigger than traditional cryptographic algorithms because you've got to realize that um, asymmetric cryptography is used everywhere in our modern world. Asymmetric cryptography is used on digital signatures for contracts and documents. Asymmetric cryptography is used on VPNs. Asymmetric cryptography is used to authenticate banking wire transfers and transactions. Asymmetric cryptography is used to lock nuclear weapons, um, to lock software on fighter jets. Um, to control communications between militaries or uh, between diplomats and their home government. Every form of secure communication, uh, asymmetric cryptography is used for all of the secure website transactions you do, SSL on your browser, the little padlock on your browser, all of the um, private communications we do on the internet use asymmetric cryptography that is vulnerable to quantum computers. Uh, so if you think about it, in fact, the uh, invention of powerful enough quantum computers to break um, the cryptography that's used um, for the majority of the world's secure communication, for all of the world's secure communications, with very few exceptions, um, that invention threatens a hell of a lot more than Bitcoin. And I wouldn't be worried about Bitcoin. You know, at that point, I would be worried about the fact that whoever has this quantum computer can read all of the communications of all of the governments, all of the militaries, and gain access to all of the data, all of the locking mechanisms of all of the weapons, uh, all of the banks, and all of the money um, for the entire world. Uh, this is a... Um, weapon of mass information destruction. That's what quantum computers are. If quantum computers um, become available to one government or maybe a few governments um, and not widely available to everybody else, and they become available before we have quantum safe algorithms for protecting communications, uh, it's a doomsday scenario basically. Uh, so really the focus right now is uh, on developing quantum safe uh, cryptography. And many, many, many researchers around the world are working on that. Uh, but fortunately, we still theoretically have uh, a couple of decades at least before it becomes a problem. I hope that was helpful in terms of quantum computing. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, Let's see what else we're going to.
Right. Uh, Aristoteles asks, could AI using quantum computing write an algorithm solve the equation? Who knows? Yeah, maybe, probably. Um, uh, quantum computing obviously also changes how AI can work. Uh, so quantum computing enables AI at a whole different uh, level than what we have already moving so fast. And, and of course, uh, if AI can also do uh, original research or produce original um, code and algorithms or do original research in mathematics, that changes the game completely again. So these, these are um, synergistic technologies, which means one feeds the other and accelerates the other. Okay, let's talk a bit about seed phrases. Um, Oswaldo asks, could you explain how the commonly used seed phrases generate seemingly unlimited private and public key pairs? I recall from a previous video that you demonstrated these seed words are roughly as strong as 256-bit keys, but I can't recall the exact detail. Also, I'm aware that there's a limited set of usable words. Does this limit the effectiveness? There's really two different topics here, which is one, understanding how seed words represent numbers. And the second one is how uh, you go from a single seed to generating sequences of uh, private keys uh, and therefore public keys and therefore addresses. Uh, so first of all, uh, seed phrases are the uh, 12 to 24 English word um, things that we use to back up wallets. And um, they represent uh, the equivalent strength of a 128 bit to 256 bit number. So a 12 word C phrase is 128 bits. A 24 word C phrase is 256 bits. How do we know that? And how can you make numbers be represented by words? Um, and so that goes to the second question by Oswaldo, which is, I'm aware there's a limited set of usable words. Does this limit the effectiveness? Uh, and this is actually where the math gets uh, interesting or the arithmetic gets interesting. Allow me to, to describe this. When you have a seed phrase, the seed phrase um, is produced by randomly selecting words from a dictionary. And I'm simplifying this. This is not actually how it's done algorithmically. It's actually by picking a 256-bit number and then converting that into words and then producing the seed phrase. But let's assume um, for simplicity that you're simply picking words from a dictionary. The dictionary that is used is a standardized dictionary um, that is defined under a standard called BIP39. Um, there are, in fact, dictionaries from multiple languages, but uh, I've only ever seen the English language dictionary in use. That dictionary has 2,048 words, 2,048 words. And that doesn't seem like a lot of words to produce the complexity of a 256-bit number, but it is, right? And why is that the case? It's because if you do the math, uh, you can actually see the correspondence between these two numbers. So let's take a 12-word seed phrase. So 12-word seed phrase, I have told you, is equivalent to 128 bits of security. What does that mean? Um, 128 bits is uh, a number that can go from zero to a value of two to the power of 128. So when you have 128 bits, that simply means the number can express up to uh, the value of two to the power of 128. That means two times two times two times two, 128 times. By the way, that is an enormous number. Um, it is um, such a vast number that human minds can't even comprehend it. And then the question is, how can you represent that with 12 words if, if it's such a vast number? And the math is really simple. If you have a dictionary of 2,048 words, 
uh, and you're picking 12 of those words at random, then you can actually do the arithmetic and figure out how many combinations of those words exist, right? Um, so let's, let's um, simplify this and take it one step at a time. You have this dictionary, and the dictionary is um, uh, above, uh, about, aardvark, um, advent, all the way down to zebra, let's say, or zoo. I don't remember what the exact words are. I know that about and above are in there. <laughs> zebra might not be. Um, but anyway, you have these specific words. And they were selected so that they're not easy to confuse with each other. So they're different enough from each other. They're not synonyms. They don't look the same. They don't sound the same. Um, and that's on purpose so that you, when you write down your backup seed phrase, it's, it's easy to know which of these words it is um, because it's not likely to be confused with a similarly pronounced or spelled or written word. Um, you're not going to find any words that are one letter different. Um, they're all going to be um, unique. In fact, one of the characteristics is that if you only have the first four letters of any of these words, you can identify which word it is. You only need the first four letters to figure out which of the 2048 words it is. But that's, that's another thing for ease of use. So you've got these words. Okay, let's pick one at random. What are the chances of picking one of these words at random? What is the probability um, assigned to each one of these words, right? There's 2048 words, so it's like rolling a dice with 2048 sides and you're picking one. So it's one over 2048. That's the probability for the first word. So when you pick the first word, it can be any of 2048. So if you're trying to break this, if you're trying to guess, um, then you have 2048 guesses for what the first word will be. What about the second word? Well, the second word can also be any of the 2048 words, and it can be the same as the first word. Uh, so that's another 2048 possibilities. So um, 2048 uh, pro possible words to choose from for the first word, 2048 possible choices for the second word. So the probability of the first and second word together is 2048 times 2048. The third word, times 2048. The fourth word, times 2048. So it's basically 2048 times 2048, 12 times in a row, uh, which is, in mathematical notation, 2048 to the power of 12. If you plug that into a calculator, you'll see that it's greater than 2 to the power of 128, which means that with 12 words, chosen from a dictionary of 2048, the number of possible combinations is greater than um, 128 bits or number that has 128 bits or the, the, the number two to the power of 128. So there's a direct equivalence. The words are numbers. They're just a way of expressing this unfathomably huge number or one random number in this unfathomably large range uh, in the form of English words. So it's easy to write down, record, transcribe, and recover without making any mistakes. That's the whole point. So the seed is a number, right? And this is very important to understand. The phrase, the 12 English words are a number. Why are they slightly more than uh, two to the 128? Um, the reason is because the last word in the sequence, the 12th word, operates as a checksum to make sure you didn't make a mistake uh, in any of the other words. So um, some of the bits that make up the last word are actually used as a checksum. And that's a complicated little um, mathematical function in there. But that's how your wallet can tell if you type your seed incorrectly or it's not a valid seed, uh, is because um, it actually takes 11 and a half words, if, if you could think of it that way, um, to produce that complexity in the half word at the end. The last four bits are used um, as a checksum.
So we're going to talk about um, passphrases and seeds in more detail at a different time. Um, Patricio says this is a different language spoken only by programmers. It's, it's not even only by programmers. Most programmers don't really understand combinatorial mathematics. This is math. And it's a specific branch of math that has to do with complexity. Um, it has to do with um, combinations, probabilities and combinations um, of choosing from very, very large numbers, right? So, uh, and part of this concept of words being numbers and um, digits and letters being numbers and binary and decimal and hexadecimal, that's uh, not just programming, that's arithmetic, uh, right? And it's arithmetic that predates computers by a very significant degree. Um, you know, we use a decimal system uh, in most civilizations because we have 10 fingers, but that's not always been the case. In fact, the most famous example against that is the fact that Babylonians used the base 60 uh, numerical system, which is where we get um, the 12 months of the year the 360 days um, in the original calendar that they had, um, the 360 degrees in a circle, and several other modern forms of measurement, uh, 60 minutes in, a, in an hour, 60 uh, seconds in a minute, all of those things come from a base 60 um, numeric system that was used by Babylonians uh, that predates modern decimal systems and makes a lot of sense. And the reason a uh, base 60 system is used is because um, the, you can divide um, uh, 60 by so many factors. Uh, so 15, 12, uh, um, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 are all factors. Uh, and it's much easier to do division, right? Uh, that's why we use that. Uh, Francisco says, 12 words are now becoming standard instead of 24. Can we say the 24-word approach is exaggerated? Yes, we can. Um, it turns out that the actual security you get from the elliptic curve algorithm is only 128 bits in practice, and therefore using 24 words is overkill. But it's overkill that comes with a cost, and the cost is recording 24 words is more difficult and more chance of you make a mistake, and it takes more space. Um, than recording 12. So if 12 gives you more or less the same security, but it's much easier to record and recover, uh, why not just use 12? And that realization led to, over the past three or four years, most of the hardware wallet vendors moving from 24 to 12 words uh, and not using 24 words. Uh, Sarah asks, uh, does the dictionary of words um, update or does it remain constant? It remains constant. So it's the same uh, from the inception in 2013. It's one dictionary uh, for compatibility and standardization. There's no reason to change those uh, words. All right. Fantastic. Um, Yes, and if you want to, if you want to really dig into the details, um, Ali pointed. You can read my book. I just want to uh, make make a quick point here, um, and and be a, a really bad uh, capitalist. Um, Mastering Bitcoin is available to read for free under an open license, and you can actually find it on GitHub if you search for Bitcoin book. So the entire source code, the book is open source, uh, was always published. The entire source code of the third edition was published in January. Um, and um, this is the same edition that you can buy from Amazon or from bookstores uh, in print. Uh, the exact same content is available for free uh, to read on GitHub. It's not as nice. It's not as convenient. It's not nicely packaged. If you want convenience and nice packaging, you can buy the book. Uh, but you can read it for free um, without uh, without any uh, problems, and that's a legal uh, license. Uh, Alisa asked, where's the list of these words? The list of these words is um, uh, on a GitHub repository uh, managed by Satoshi Labs. 
um, under the name BIP39, which is the standard. Um, and, it, it, and it's also in every uh, wallet in terms of in the software, um, there's a list of those words in order the 2048 words so that the wallet can produce seed. So uh, the original source is, is in a source repository, um, but that list of words now exists in every piece of software. And that kind of wraps up what we had time to do today. Uh, I can see that I didn't manage to answer eight questions in the Q&A and two questions from the forums. So that's the lesson of the day. The lesson of the day is ask your questions in the forum. And if you ask it early and if you ask it clearly, and if it's on topic for the week's topic, then you'll get it answered. And if you wait until the chat, or if you don't ask it clearly, or if it's slightly off topic, then you won't get it answered uh, in the live stream. So uh, that's the lesson for the day. I'll see you next Thursday. This has been uh, session three for the Massive Open Online course by the University of Nicosia's Masters in Digital Currencies. I'm your teacher, Andreas Amantonopoulos. It's been a pleasure answering your questions. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.